Hello everybody and welcome back to talk to all of you again today and today we're going to talk about Petropavlovsk, our favorite wargaming fantasy ship. Or is it? We're going to take a look at the uh, vessel today and see if whether or not she is purely just something pulled out of thin air, whether there is some degree of validity to it. So on the agenda today, first things first, a little bit about the design spiral, a uh, very kind of a key idea in naval architecture. We're also going to talk about principal particulars, talk about the hull form a little bit, talk a little bit about resistance and powering, and then you'll notice it will kind of fall off the cliff in terms of what we have, because there's a ton of unknowns. Machinery? Nope, no real information on that. Crew complement? Don't really know that either. General arrangement? Yeah, we don't have much information about that. Structure? Nope. Trim and stability? Not really. Sea keeping, yep. Vulnerability signature, also not. And cost. So, all the unknowns will have an impact on whether or not the vessel is feasible or not. And I'll get there and I'll explain that uh, a little bit from now. But let's start off with the design spiral. Very kind of a key idea in Nave architecture. And for those of you who are like, what is this? Why is it important? Let me kind of explain. So, we start off with a set of requirements so you can think of that as your mission profile what is the vessel supposed to do what kind of weapons is she supposed to carry how fast does she go how far does she go what kind of environments does she operate in etc 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 now once you have your initial requirements then you figure out a bunch of other things right like you know, weapon configurations things like that and all as you go around the circle you figure out different pieces of important information eventually with warships, you come to sort of a displacement value, right? An initial displacement value. From there, you'll figure out, hey, so on you know this kind of displacement, how big of a vessel am I looking at? So you come up with some kind of principal particulars, the dimensions, and then you create a hull form. And then from there, you figure out, you know, hey, what kind of resistance is this going to have? What kind of powering do I need to put in? Select the machinery that's going to be appropriate figure out how many people you've got to fit onto this vessel for the vessel to function, start making arrangements, things like that, right? Now, the key idea in the spiral is really that no first turn of the spiral is going to get you anywhere close to an optimized design. You've got to go through it multiple iterations before you come to something that's actually any good. So typically for any vessel, you're going to go around the spiral quite a large number of times. And really, you can also think about it as sort of being in different stages, right? So let's say the outermost circle is the roughest, right? So you can almost think of that as like a concept stage. And then later on, once you get past the concept stage, you enter a preliminary stage where you go into a little bit more detail, so more detailed drawings, things like that. And as you go through that multiple times, you eventually come to the contract stage. That's the stage where you start to sign contracts with, let's say, the government, whatnot, and you figure out, hey, this is how much you're going to pay me for me to build this ship for you, right? Now, the entire purpose of this, like I said earlier, is to come to something that's very, very optimized, the ideal design for what the mission requires. Now, as you go around, you'll realize that a ton of stuff has an impact on a ton of other stuff, right? But typically, what you do is you go through one turn of the spiral, you go, oh, crap, okay, so something I did in structure has an impact now on the general arrangement. Okay, but I'm not gonna go back and fix the general arrangement right now because I don't know what a bunch of other stuff is gonna you know, cause in terms of impacts and things like that. All right, let's just complete one spiral, one turn of the spiral, and then on the next turn of the spiral, I'll address some of these issues that I found the first time around. Then once you're going through that next turn, again, you're gonna run into new problems. So again, rinse, repeat, right? Loads of times around this, this uh, spiral. And the end goal is creating the most optimized design possible. What about the Petropavlovsk then? Well, yeah, I mean, the best I can say is someone at least tried to make it reasonable, <laughs> but you'll see how I got to that conclusion a little bit later on. So we'll do some rough checking and let's see what we can find. So the first things first is what's the mission requirement? Well, the only one that we have listed anywhere that I can find in game is that it's supposed to counter the Des Moines class heavy cruiser. And that's kind of it. There's no real specifications about you know, range, speed performance, none of that stuff is really kind of set as a requirement. It's more just like, here it is, this is the vessel, right? So because there's nothing really concrete, that's a bit of a problem for a naval architect because no real set defined mission requirements means that 
the guiding light for helping us design a ship is not really there. So I'll give you an example of this is, let's say there was a mission requirement for X range for the Petropavlovsk. Without knowing that, um, I wouldn't be able to figure out, let's say, how much fuel this vessel is supposed to carry. Therefore, I wouldn't be able to figure out how big the fuel tanks are supposed to be. That's kind of an issue, right? Because in reality, if you were to build the ship for real, if you had, let's say, insufficient amounts of fuel and your vessel couldn't reach the required range, you're now in breach of contract, which means that if you're the shipyard, that's not a good thing, right? Now, of course, because we're playing a video game, no clear mission statement for the Petropavlos, except for something basic like it's supposed to fight and defeat Des Moines. It's good for wargaming because they can just kind of make it up as they go, right? I mean, this whole form could work when we don't really need to know how much range, let's say, this vessel has, <laughs> you know, um, because who cares? We can put as much stuff we ought, you know, we want on it. And if the vessel's range is, you know, hypothetically 100 nautical miles, it basically requires a tiny bit of fuel and it will technically complete the mission with the hole it has right now. In reality, of course, it's going to be quite different, right? Anyhow, what about the displacement, right? So, you, you know, you set out all the requirements, essentially, you, you figure all the weapons. What's the kind of displacement? Well, the best we figure out with what we have in-game right now is that the in-game model suggests that the vessel is about 24,762 tons. But of course, during a design phase, nobody's that accurate, right? So my guess is that she's probably based on some sort of 25,000 ton design. Um, again, that's guesstimate, and it's uh, based on the model that we have in-game. So if you consider that the Des Moines class heavy cruisers were 21,269 tons fully loaded, this kind of makes sense because the vessel is supposed to outperform the Des Moines. So a 25,000 ton displacement, you know, considering that the vessel is supposed to have bigger guns, better armor, does make sense that she's probably going to displace a little bit more. So with that in mind, with that 25,000 ton displacement in mind, let's take a look at the vessel's principal particulars. And really, you use something called a state-of-the-art analysis or you know, just really comparable vessels, and you're going to create a bunch of graphs for them, right? So you collect data on comparable ships, and then you plot them. So you generate things like displacement versus length, length versus beam, beam versus draft, things like that. And then you also see if the ratios make sense, such as length beam ratio, beam draft ratio, you got to make sure that those are somewhat reasonable as well. All right, so the graphs for <laughs> the displacement versus length and where the Petropavlovsk comes in, you'll see that for her displacement, they've made it a little bit longer, I think, because you can see that it goes away from the trend line. There's other vessels, as you can see on the data, that is also away from the trend line, but she's just a little bit further away than most of the other vessels. And then you see the same repeats for like length versus beam. For the length that she is in uh, the game depicted, you can see that she just doesn't really seem to have sufficient amounts of beam. She's a little bit less in that department. And then beam versus draft, for the beam that she's got right now, she's got a pretty substantial draft where, you know, if you look at the previous graph here, for the length that she has, has she had, let's say, a bigger beam, then her draft would have actually made a bit more sense, right? Because if you actually look, if you move the beam a little bit wider, the current draft makes sense because, you know, the trend line is heading in that direction. So, principle particular wise, what we have in game is a little bit away from the trend line in almost most of the situations here, which suggests that the values that we currently have are maybe not as optimized. Now, there's something else to be said here. Why would we do this? Why compare to similar type of vessels? Why do the comparable vessels kind of thing? It's because, generally speaking, if you're coming to a ship design and you look at other already established vessels, you would assume that those already established vessels are already highly optimized designs, which means that other naval architects had already designed a ship to accomplish X mission, and it's already highly, 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 you know, optimized. Where if you can then start off at a more optimized point, you're saving yourself some time and some, you know, also the reason why, if you look historically, 
there's a reason why a lot of vessel development stuff is like top secret, right? Countries were not releasing data about their vessels. But anyways, as you can see with Petro, I think she could have been a little bit different in terms of some of her principal particulars. Anyways, still, none of the data points, even though they are away from the trend line, are at a point that's like ridiculous. None of them are like so far away that you go, okay, that's a way, like that's entire outlier right there. Like she's far, but it's not to a point where I go, okay, that's unacceptable, right? It's still, there's other vessels, you know, that have similar type of, I guess, placements away from the trend line. So not unacceptable. All right. The other thing, of course, is that there are uh, ratios. Now, there was a 1992 RENA paper uh, on the variety of monohull warship geometry by uh, a fellow called Van Griethsen. Oh, gosh. Someone who is Dutch is going to just cringe right there. <laughs> Anyways, uh, in the paper, um, there was a bunch of ratios that were set out, right? So there's like length beam ratio, um, you know, like length depth ratio, beam draft ratio, things like that. Now, you'll see that there is a row uh for um cruisers and you take a look at petropavlovsk and you see how she stacks up well her length to beam ratio is 10.043 which is right at the upper limit for the length beam ratio so acceptable i mean again that probably could have been tweaked a little bit right based on the state of the art data and that probably would have yielded a little bit better um ratio then you look at, let's say, something like beam versus draft, 2.72. So you look at beam draft for cruisers, lower end is 2.5, upper end 3.2, also fits. Where there is one value that's a little bit off is this one. Length to depth. Now, depth, when it comes to warships, is defined as from essentially the keel up to the main deck, right? Um, and... The ratio for the petrol is 19, <laughs> which means that there is a lot more length than there is depth, which I think explains why we feel like the Petropavlovsk is a bit of a submarine when we look at it in-game. We're like, oh, she looks like she's kind of sitting a bit low there. Um, if you think about the Des Moines, for example, Des Moines is 15, and in the Rena paper, cruisers are like supposed to be around 12. So definitely kind of suggests that maybe there's a little bit of an issue with the depth value for the Petropavlovsk, right? Okay, so now with the principal particular set, the next thing that you really do is you create a whole form. So you develop a whole form and you obviously want a whole form that is going to hit the values that you require. So like, for example, not only like length, beam, uh, depth, draft but also things like for example you know like your prismatic coefficients you know like all that kind of stuff right as well as you do want at the end of the day the lines of your hull form to be relatively fair so anyways based on the vessel we have a length overall of 233 meters being about 23.2 uh, meters uh draft of 8.5 meters right and this once you've got the hull form completed you will then go and figure out the resistance and propulsion of the hull form now, in the version that we have right now, the whole form has already been created, right? Wargaming has used some kind of, uh, you know, drawing that they found or whatnot to model the whole form. So this allows us kind of to skip the whole development phase and really kind of just jump into resistance and propulsion to see what happens. So using whole trap and menin, which is uh, like kind of a way to predict resistance of a whole form, yields the following. So the total resistance uh, of the Petropavlov's call at the 32.5 knot speed that it is listed as having in game, the total resistance is 3,022 kilonewtons. Now that yields an effective power of 50,529 kilowatts or 67,733 horsepower. Now you'll notice that there's an asterisk and the asterisk is basically this. The vessel that we have in game is a little bit outside the parameter parameters of whole drop menin, which means that there, you know it's not as reliable because you have some things that fall in sort of outside the boundaries right i'm mostly using it as a bit of a fast and dirty check uh right now obviously on another turn of the spiral getting a bit more serious i'll use something like let's say the taylor gertler series data to make a better uh, prediction right okay so you're looking at that and you're like, hold on a second, effective power, 
60 some odd thousand horsepower what's going on there right so effective power is not shaft horsepower that's not what's going on there that's because you have to account for all the losses and this kind of i guess little uh flow chart thing is the best way to uh, explain it right you can see pe is at the very 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 far right that's the end of everything shaft power is ps so you see you've actually got to account for the losses you know from the hull from the propeller from the shaft and the bearings and all that before you get to shaft horsepower so shaft horsepower by the way is what we see listed in the propulsion category in game right so if we do a bit of guesswork here so we factor in the losses roughly for the hull the propeller um, and then we factor in the losses along, you know, the bearings, the shaft, things like that. And then we factor in the margin because you figure that, you know, most real warship designers would say, okay, look, our ship is obviously not just going to function in perfectly calm waters. It's probably going to go out and encounter some rough weather, things like that. So let's put in some margins there just so that there's a bit of extra power just in case we need to maintain a certain speed in certain kind of con uh, conditions. And what we get is actually remarkably close um from my calculations 137,380 shaft horsepower is what i got based on the um you know again effective power and accounting for all the losses and stuff like that and in game it's listed as 140,000 shaft horsepower so not too too far off here right now of course you can look at that and go okay well there's some discrepancies there yeah absolutely right um it's totally expected I mentioned earlier that Holtrop had a certain requirement that I was outside of, right? And that one, which was both, uh, mostly related to the uh, length beam ratio. Um, so Holtrop requires that sort of the upper limit for length beam is 9.5. For Petro, we're at 10. So it's a little bit outside, right? Like I said, you know, on the next turn of the spiral, I would go for something with a little bit, you know, better fit, a little bit more reliable data, but that would take a lot more time. This is the quick and dirty thing, right? Also, you got to think about things like, you know, the appendages, the resistance caused by that wasn't necessarily factored in on this first sort of rough, quick and dirty calculation. I would expect that if, you know, I get a more accurate number and I made the margins a little bit more reasonable and, you know, was a little bit more accurate when it comes to losses, I'd get pretty close. So yeah, quick and dirty, right? Overall, next turn of spiral, probably get a little bit better uh, data. But it is, you know, it has to be said that the value that Wargaming listed in game at 140,000 shaft horsepower, not exactly unrealistic. It's actually a pretty realistic number to a certain degree. Okay, so the next thing we want to discuss is propellers. So if you ever looked at Petropavlovsk in like the design uh, desk port view or in the dockyard, whatever, you'll see that she's got these two big honking propellers. And a long time ago when I looked at that, I was like, hmm, would that work? Are those propellers realistic? Is that the kind of propellers that she'd be using? Questions. But a long time ago, I didn't have answers to that. Now I've got the knowledge. Haha. -ha. All right. So first things first, of course, is that within your propulsion train, the greatest losses are coming from the propeller. This is where you're going to be uh, suffering your greatest losses. So... As a naval architect, what you're looking for is the most efficient propeller possible that can handle the amount of power that you're putting through it. And generally speaking, what you're looking for is the largest, slowest turning propeller possible because that's the best thing from an efficiency standpoint. Now, why do you want max efficiency? Is because you want to lose as little of your propulsive power as possible because if you lose a lot here, you've got to make it up somewhere else. Notably, you know, bigger uh, turbines, things like that, right? Maybe more boilers, etc. So, you also, by the way, don't want cavitation. So, even if you pick a propeller and you go, okay, cool, I got a propeller, this is the most efficient thing possible, but then you check for cavitation, you find out that the propeller is cavitating all the time, that's no good. You've got to pick something that is super efficient, but also doesn't cavitate. So, you have to check it, right, when you're going for the propellers. Another thing is that uh, the diameter of the propeller is typically determined uh, by uh, both the vessel's draft as well as the tip clearance requirements. Now, typically for a conventional shaft like this, you expect that from where the hull is, your tip clearance is about 20%, which, and I should say this, on the Petropavlovsk model, when I looked at it, it appeared that the tip clearance is in excess of 20%. Now, there could be very good reasons for that, 
but there's a possibility that the propeller could maybe be a bit, bit bigger. <laughs> but those are all things that, again, would you'd have to look at in like significantly more detail. Anyhow, continuing on, you would start typically because now you've known sort of what kind of power you're putting through it, uh, what the diameter of the propeller should be, things like that. You can do a preliminary search using something called a BP Delta chart. And you go through that process and you'd see if you can find yourself a propeller and then you can check for cavitation, things like that. And then you can say, okay, I've got a good preliminary propeller, right? But in the game right now, the propellers are already modeled. They're B595 propeller. So they're five bladed and they have a blade area ratio of about 95%. So this allows me to just kind of skip the BP Delta, you know, sort of step and move on to something called the KJ chart um, for this propeller to see, you know, what kind of characteristics it would have on Petropavlovsk, whether it would work, and also what type of, um, you know, situation would this propeller have in terms of cavitation, right? Investigate it. So this is um, a KJ chart, and I did an investigation you know, did the plot for it. And guess what? For a 4.9 meter prop, which is roughly what Petropavlovsk appears to have in game, um, the propeller actually does work. Um, the pitch diameter ratio is 1.08. Uh, the propeller is actually turning at 215 RPM. Efficiency is about 63, maybe 64%, which is not bad. And on top of that, yeah, using Burl's method, there's no cavitation for this particular uh, prop. So, in terms of what we're seeing in game, in terms of propulsion and the propellers that we're seeing, it actually works. So up until this point, pretty good, you know, with what we know so far. The only thing is that length depth thing, that is a bit questionable. Everything else up until this point seems actually pretty realistic. But <laughs> before you rush off to a shipyard and go, okay, build me this now, um, there's a lot of other questions you got to answer, and this is where things get really complicated. First of all, do you, as a nation, have the required machinery? Is this available? Is this machinery, and if it's something you do not have, can you acquire it from somewhere? And if none of those things are there, you might have to opt for different kind of, you know, machinery, and that might or might not produce the amount of power you need. So you might have to re-examine certain things. How much crew do you have on this vessel? Well you know a ship needs people in order to actually operate so we don't know that um but if you did you'd have to figure out okay well if i have this much crew uh, you know i've got to feed them i've got to allow them to sleep and i got to let them use the facilities all of that requires space and you've got to put that into your design which also basically means that you'd have to do something called a general arrangement you have to really figure out if the hull the form that you've developed so far has the sufficient amount of space for everything that you need. And if you don't, well, you might have to modify certain things, right? So a general arrangement could go back around and have an impact on your hull form. And by the way, if you change your hull form, you change your resistance and propulsion, which changes a bunch more stuff, and you can just kind of go in circles. And this is why you go through a design spiral. What about the structure of the vessel? Well, you know, considering that she has what appears to be an ice strengthened region i would assume that you know this vessel is supposed to be ice strengthened well of course once you start to you know get all the structure in first of all that structure that you put in might have an impact on your general arrangement you might have certain places where you go oh nuts here's an awkward thing that came down in the middle of a space and this space is super critical i can't have this here so i've got to move that while well, moving that changes another piece of structure all of that at the end of the day by the way has an impact on what's the actual weight that you have in terms of steel weight, machinery weight, all that kind of stuff, right? That all ends up playing a role. And then depending on what your weight is based on your new uh, calculations and drawings and things like that, your vessel might suddenly have a different displacement from what you initially assumed it to have. Well, then now what happens? Because maybe your vessel is a little bit you know, shallower. Maybe it's a bit deeper. Well, if it's a bit deeper, maybe the amount of space you have for your propeller changes. Now you can go for a different size propeller, which goes back and changes your propulsion characteristics. Well, characteristics in terms of, uh, you know, how big the propeller and how efficient it is and therefore how much power you might need, things like that. Well, you might also have a situation where, hey, you've slightly increased the amount of frictional resistance now. Okay, that has an impact as well, right? 
You also have a situation where maybe the vessel is now a little bit lighter. Okay, now she's coming out of the water a little bit more, and that propeller that you originally had that was actually sitting comfortably underwater is now breaching the surface. That's not good. You've got to make some adjustments there. Sea keeping characteristics, right? You know, if your vessel's at a point where you know, in any kind of rough weather, she's taking a lot of water, you know, off the, you know, on the bow. Okay, that. Maybe things don't work there. You've got to make some adjustments, and you know maybe we'll give it a a nice uh, you know kind of like the way the Germans had with uh, let's say the Scharnhorst, you know the, the nice Atlantic bow, right? Things like that. Vulnerability signature, no clue, not an idea about that at all, right? Because we only have an in-game vessel. And then finally, what about cost, right? Yeah, I know, glorious Soviet Union, communist country, but you know. You still got a you know a budget. You still got to pay for the thing somehow, and th that budget, by the way, determines a ton of stuff. Because if there's no money for certain things, you're just not doing it. And by the way, the way of budgets have gone historically speaking have had a huge impact on vessel designs. Give a naval architect a limited budget, and yes, we really might build something ridiculous like an H class battleship. But then, you know, once you factor in, hey, look, we're only willing to spend this much money on the Navy this year, has a way to dampen um, <laughs> the creative instincts, <laughs> shall we say. And so, you know, as you can see, with all of the unknown data, we don't really know if the vessel itself is actually feasible to be built in real life. We just know that from the initial little bit that we can see, yes, Petropavlovsk at least is somewhat feasible. So many more turns around the spiral required, right? In order to have an actual real thing that you can actually start building. Of course, you look at the model and there are some things that could pop out. Like, for example, where are the cranes? <laughs> I've been wondering that. <laughs> where are the cranes? Because you've obviously got these launches that you're supposed to somehow get off the vessel. But there's nothing notable. I mean, yeah, there's a derrick there, but I don't think that's enough to lift a big, heavy captain's launch. So I guess, you know, Stronk Ivan just go over and toss it over the side of the vessel <laughs> seems to be the way to go. Um, but yeah, anyways, um, you know, that's my take on Petropavlovsk, at least somewhat plausible, at least for the video game universe. Realistically speaking, though, there's just too much stuff that we have zero ideas about. And uh, we really need to know more before we can say, aha, yes, this vessel is or is not possible. Anyways, um, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe for me nerding out on Vessel some more and a lot more PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> if you ever want to discuss stuff about uh, vessels, uh, of course, you can always find me on Discord um, for discussions on ship design. So aside from all that, folks, I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Have yourselves a good one. I'll talk to all of you again next time.